So uh, in the first 10 minute talk, uh, I'll describe an abstraction that we've designed for modeling prediction problems. And this abstraction is the, at the heart of the platform that we are building at Select. Uh, the platform is called PDB, and PDB is short for prediction database. Uh, the second talk will actually be about the architecture of the platform itself. So the way we think about uh, our platform is it's a software layer. So it works like a database in the sense that you can query it. You can query it for data. If data is in the database, you get back the data. If it's not, you get back a prediction along with confidence and some provenance information. Uh, and when we were building it, we wanted it to work with all kinds of data sources. So it should work with text. It should work with numeric data, with images geospatial data, time series, et cetera. And it should work with all kinds of prediction problems. So it should be able to do out of the box time series predictions, classification, anomaly detection, right? So the entire list. Um, so before we could build something like this, we found we needed the right abstraction, right? We needed a flexible abstraction to talk about <laughs> prediction problems. So the analogy here is with SQL and what it did for databases. Right. So what SQL did for databases, it decoupled the description of the data we want to fetch from where this data is stored and instructions for actually accessing the data. So this allowed us to focus on the logic, and we outsourced kind of the fetching of the data and all these mechanics to the database. And we want something very similar, right? except we want this for data science. Uh, we want to be able to focus on the fun pieces, the modeling of the data, figuring out the right features, building the right models, and have the work of building the pipelines, maintaining them, outsourced to the prediction database. So to explain the abstraction itself, I'll do this with a simple toy problem. So I'll use the popular movie recommendation problem. Right? And the way I want to visualize the data is in sheets. So like an Excel file. Right? In this case, there's four sheets. Uh, tags and ratings. And this is similar to the movie lens data set. So the movie has all kinds of features of the movies in our data set. So in this case, title, genre, the year in which it was produced. Um, users is similar. So users has features of the user. Right? It identifies each of the user. It gives them an ID. And it tells us the name, age, location, and gender. Um, tags and ratings are a bit different. right? Tags and ratings are both interactions in that they involve both a movie and a user. So a tag is something that any user who watches a movie can give that movie. So it can be random text. So some users put in something to do with the genre. Some users tag the actors in the movie. It can be arbitrary. And finally, rating. Right? And for the problem of predicting or movie recommendations, ratings is really what we want to predict. Uh, it's typically very sparse. Uh, not all users have seen all movies. And the task here is for a movie user pair, where we don't have a rating in the system, to predict that rating. So what does the PDB abstraction look like for this data set? Well, for every cell in this Excel file, we model it as a key value pair. So the value is whatever happens to be in that cell. Uh, if it's an image or text, it's a vectorized form of it. And the key is how we address that value. Right? And in this case, the key is uniform. It always consists of two components. The first component is an operation. Uh, operation tells us kind of what kind of data it is. Right? So it's what kind of relationship are we trying to model. The second component is a pair of IDs. So ID1 and ID2. And in general, they talk about the entities in our data set. So in this simple case, there are two kinds of entities. There's the users. And there's the movies. So the users here are from 1 to m, the movies from 1 to n. And you can think of these as points in a graph. right? So these are vertices in a graph. And every data point we have in our data set will be an edge in our graph. So for instance, take uh, rating. Right? So this is one data point. It says that the rating that user 1 gave movie n is a 5. Right? So the operation here is rating. It tells us what kind of data 5 is. ID1 identifies a particular user. And ID2 identifies a particular movie. Right. So now the movie sheet. 
uh, movie sheet looks like this. Now we no longer have two entities involved. There's just one entity, the movie. Uh, the operation is either genre or title. Uh, and since we have only one entity, ID2 is a null. And ID1 is either movie one or movie n. So it's the genre of movie one is a comedy. And we do the same thing for users, right? So the gender of user M is male, and tags kind of looks like ratings. So operation is tag, ID1 is user one, ID2 is movie one. Uh, and the value is a vectorized form of, of screwball comedy. So we've actually found that even though this as a representation looks very simple, it's able to model all kinds of relationships in the data. We've modeled fairly complicated sets of relationships, and we can model all problems using the same abstraction. And in general, it looks like a tensor completion problem. Um, in particular, it looks like a three-order tensor completion problem. One dimension is operation, and you can view the data as slices along operation. And each of those slices has two axes, ID1 and ID2. And any time we want a, a piece of data that's not in the data set, that looks like a tensor completion problem. So we specify operation, we specify ID1 and ID2. So that forms the key, and we query for the value. So what do we get with an abstraction like this? So what we found when we were building pipelines is inevitably we had to stitch together several data sources in order to get something good out of the system. Different data sources organize data differently. They call the same thing different names. Uh, so typically it's hard to stitch them together. It requires some custom work each time. But once we processed them and had them represented using some common vocabulary, stitch stitching them together is much easier. And when we have intermediate models, intermediate predictions, they're easy to use across multiple pipelines, across multiple predictions. Uh, the other thing we found was what would normally happen is we would start working on a data set. We would build some models, be able to predict something. And immediately, someone would want to predict something else. And when we had stored our data and our models in kind of very specific form, so when we had feature vectors, for instance, it wasn't trivial, so predicting something else meant building one more pipeline to do that. Uh, here we have an abstraction that's not tied to what we are predicting, and asking a different prediction question is really easy. And the last thing is that, so now we have this abstraction. All our, abstra all our algorithms are coded only to work with this abstraction. We have nothing else that we deal with. But that means we know exactly how to lay out data for, for efficiency, both for compute and for querying. And we don't have to redo this work of optimizing, you know, how should I partition my data, what indices I built, every time we get a new data set. And all our pipelines look homogeneous. They are built based on exactly the same abstraction. It's the same code, making maintaining them really easy. So what we found was having an abstraction like this that let us decouple what the data was and what ETL pipelines were from what the algorithm and machine learning pipelines was really helped us build our uh, platform really efficiently. So after the break, I'll talk in a bit more detail about what our platform architecture looks like. Thank you. <laughs>